You're watching EASD TV and you're very welcome. We're now going to talk a bit more about COVID-19. We've already talked a bit about long COVID, but the impact of COVID is immense right across our populations. So let's introduce our three speakers and I'm going to get you to introduce yourselves. Yeah, hello, my name is Barbara Ludwig. I'm an endocrinologist, diabetologist. I'm from University of Dresden in Germany, and I'm heading the ILA transplant program there and a large outpatient unit for patients primarily with type 1 diabetes. Martin. Hi, um, I'm Martin Ritter. I'm a professor of cardiometabolic medicine at the University of Manchester. Uh, I'm also an honorary consultant physician at Manchester Royal. And I'm Stephen Bornstein, Chair of Medicine at University of Dresden and Transcampus Dean King's College London. Let's start with you, Martin. What's been the impact of COVID for people living with diabetes? Well, there's quite well documented, you know, severe consequences from getting COVID when uh, you have diabetes. In the first wave of the pandemic, um, a third of the in-hospital deaths occurred in people with diabetes, which was, you know, quite an alarming statistic. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes are about twofold risk of higher risk of dying as a consequence of COVID, and people with type 1 diabetes are, are threefold higher compared to the general population. So, the direct, of, direct effects of COVID are really quite profound, um, and you know I think we'll, many of us will be very familiar with those data. Um, there are also you know quite significant indirect effects. Uh, primary care physicians were advised to reduce their contact with their patients when the COVID pandemic came along. So interactions with primary care staff were reduced and, and this has had effects on uh, the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So the number of people diagnosed with diabetes dropped dramatically and we can talk about that. Um, and the monitoring of people with diabetes was also affected by this reduced access to primary care services. So there's a lot of work to do to catch up, you know, once we've got over the immediate impacts, the direct effects of the infection, there's a lot to do to catch up. And was that something that you saw in Germany too? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you what you just described. I mean, we ha have a patient cohort here with diabetes that is of specific risk the most um, risky comorbidity um, in patients to uh, also um, see uh, where we see severe um, courses of um, uh, corona infections. And what we also learned, and I think you touched on that, uh, that it is very important, it's not just the diabetes itself, it's the poor glycemic control actually that is the major determinant um, of how patients are at risk. And so that's why we really need to focus on a very close monitoring and also clear guidance and recommendations on how to improve patient glycemic control in order to reduce the risk um, associated with diabetes and um, uh, corona infection. But there's clearly a big catch-up needed to try and pick up all these people who have not yet been diagnosed. I mean, it's really alarming, your figures, isn't it, Martin? How, what kind yeah. of scale are we talking about? Well, just in the first year of the pandemic, between March and December of 2020, our research estimated that there was approximately 60,000 people with type 2 diabetes that weren't diagnosed in that year that would normally have been diagnosed based on historical trends. And I suspect that uh, there's even more, you know, between December 2020 and now that have yet to be diagnosed. And of course, the pandemic led to, you know, a lot of people staying at home, eating probably unhealthily, stress, Not doing any exercise. weight gain. So our estimates are based on historical trends and it's very likely that because of the increased obesity in the community and particularly in those people with non-diabetic hyperglycemia who are at high risk of getting diabetes, that the estimates that we've made have actually been underestimated and there's probably a lot more diabetes out there in the community. Um, that hasn't been picked up so far. And obviously that's a problem for these people because untreated diabetes is causing damage to organs like the heart and the kidney and so on. And Stefan, the other thing that we're seeing is, I mean, you know, clearly the, very well outlined here, a much greater risk for people 
with diabetes. But also what we're seeing now is that people are developing diabetes consequent to COVID infection. And are we clear yet whether that's a consequence or you know, a, a sort of de novo or merely an acceleration of perhaps something that was going to happen anyway? Yeah, I think we know for many years, uh, Vivian, that um, if you were a virus or for a virus, it can be attractive to go into a beta cell, an endocrine cell, because um, replication apparatus producing proteins, hormones, um, exists in endocrine cells. So uh, we've known that possibly Coxsackie virus, other virus have been triggers in causing uh, type 1 diabetes. Uh, and of course, um, similar things may have happened with um, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC had a very concerning report that um, suggested that possibly there was an increase of two and a half times as compared to other infections uh, of new onset type 1 diabetes. We don't know if this is true. We are looking into a registry of about 1,000 patients currently, and it's mostly type 2 that was triggered by COVID-19. Um, and But we have to monitor this, these patients and we have to keep on because that's too early to say if we had this increase. Um, clearly, there is sort of a co-evolution between diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and this new pandemic has built on the pre-existing pandemic. And um, I think we nearly have to follow up in the next couple of years to manage this pandemic, the long-term consequences, but also future pandemics. And the scary thing about this virus seems to be that even, well, even if you get it mildly, it still may have an effect. And even with vaccination, there are still an awful lot of people getting the Omicron variants. I mean, they're not getting them badly. In that sense, you know, it's very good news because people are being protected against severe COVID. But you wonder if that mild infection is still going to be the trigger in the way that it is with severe infection. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so in fact, uh, so you touched on that, uh, um, the newly diagnosed diabetes, also more a phenotype, type 1 diabetes, like we are seeing um, also in patients that had actually very mild or even not, no symptoms at all. So this is not, not a determinant of um, the consequences, the potential consequences. And so the, the, the diabetes forms we see following um, a COVID infection, um, the phenotypes are very different. So we see some very rapid fulminant um, manifestations. We also see mild manifestations over months. Um, so this is really concerning and we simply don't know enough about it and that's why it's so important to have these registries, global registries and follow up on that in order to get more insight into the pathogenesis and also the outcome of these patients. Stefan, tell me a bit more about the kind of registries that are being set up because it seems to me to be absolutely critical in yeah. trying to get the data. I think uh, just very importantly that the, the, the three groups that suffered most in, in addition to those that had um, diabetes following COVID-19 uh, were patients with kidney diseases, were patients with overweight and also with diabetic with wound healing. But uh, for identifying um, now the, the, the longitudinal um, development of this whole pandemic, um, we set up a uh, overall continents, uh, um, doctors, physicians, to report cases where it was a clear um, in time connection of um, new onset type 2 diabetes, type 1 transient diabetes. Um, most of these general physicians um, could not deliver all the samples we would like to look at, autoantibodies and so forth. Um, so we started analyzing this and it hopefully will be published soon. But important is also to continue to go back to these GPs and doctors on different regions in the world and see, um, did the diabetes disappear? Was it 
in some cases really a transient diabetes, which may not mean that even if it goes away, it could come back a few years later. Um, so I think um, a bit like you know uh, some of the aging studies or Framingham studies, we have to monitor that for a long time to learn of what really happened um, in this pandemic, which affected the whole world, I mean, yes. And perhaps you'll also focus research on some of these viruses that cause perhaps a transient hypoglycemia, but then, but then things revert to normal, or so we think. I mean, it, it, so, Martin, yeah. what are the areas of research that we now need to focus on? Well, I think uh, looking at populations of people, and um, I talked about the, the reduction in the, the rate of diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, and one of the hard things to do really is to work out whether the, the spike in diabetes that occurs as a consequence of COVID is actually just a catch-up. Um, are we seeing cases that would have been diagnosed before the pandemic and um, they've just surfaced now? I think that's an important piece of work. Um, the other, I think, thing to do from a practical point of view is to, to catch up with the testing of people with diabetes. Normally, as you probably know, people have, um, have health checks done on a yearly basis to monitor things like their glycemic control, their blood pressure, their lipids, their renal function. And of course, all of that testing uh, just stopped virtually in, in many general practices. So. There's a huge amount of catch-up to do in the community. It's not necessarily research, although I think research can probably help because there's a big variation in the amount of catch-up that's been done in different areas of the country. So some areas are doing very well indeed, and some areas are really falling very far behind. So understanding how we can best support underperforming areas and underperforming practices through research potentially uh, is is valuable, I think. Um, it's. I think it's a big problem because, you know, without good monitoring, uh, diabetes causes complications and uh, it's only by doing tests of blood pressure and lipids and glycemic control that we really get a handle on whether we're really controlling this disease. And of course we're not out of the coronavirus woods by any manner of means. I think we'll see many more rolling waves coming through. Stefan, I want to just conclude by um, just returning to long COVID. How much more at risk are people living with diabetes from long COVID if they get COVID? Well, it's absolutely clear that just like the metabolic syndrome, not only diabetes, overweight, hypertension, lipid disorders um, have predisposed for severe COVID and also for long COVID. We don't have the statistics yet because it's multifaceted. Um, but it's also very clear to me, if I were a young scientist, or if I were to start my career, really to focus on a better understanding how metabolic factors, endocrine factors, trigger this infection susceptibility, and how these post-infectious syndromes, not only covert, um, are related to our classical metabolic endocrine diseases. And this is not only important understanding the mechanisms, it's also treatment and a way of prevention for further problems that we will see. I'm sure that we will get quite some substantial influenza and other um, uh, infections coming back after two, three years now. And um, this topic is not going to go away. And it's also in a positive sense, to conclude with something positive, an exciting area for uh, clinicians and, f and scientists to focus on. Well, thank you all very much indeed. So, COVID uh, still with us, still haunting us, but actually a very fertile ground for research. And we've been talking a lot about early career researchers. This might be a very good area to concentrate on. Bye for now. <laughs>